Hi everybody, welcome back to To Be Like Christ for more explorations in the book of Mark. Today we're talking about Mark, ch Mark chapter 3, and uh, before we begin, uh, I can't speak, before we be 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 begin, we <laughs> remember to get the notes off of the description down below, there's a link down there, and uh, you may also be interested, we have a full Matthew study with a full set of notes for free on the website to be like Christ.com. You can get there with the links down below. There's also a free ebook for anyone who is uh, just starting off their Bible exploration and wants some introductory information. So today we're talking about Mark chapter three. We're gonna do it in one video, unlike the last chapter that we did in two videos. Remember, this is largely the content that's found in Matthew chapter 12. So to read the parallel account, you can go to uh, Matthew chapter 12 and read a lot of these same stories. Remember in Mark chapter 2, we talked about uh, Jesus answering some questions about fasting and why his disciples don't fast. <clears throat> and also, um, he, was, he gave that discussion about him being the Lord of the Sabbath. <clears throat> as to, uh, to answer the Pharisees' complaint about his disciples picking grain in the field on the Sabbath day. That brings us into chapter 3. <clears throat> Let's read verses 1 through 6. And again, he entered the synagogue, and a man with a withered hand, or, and there was a man with a withered hand, and they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. And the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. So immediately following the accusations about uh, his disciples picking grain, Jesus enters the synagogue as he often did on the Sabbath day. Don't allow the chapter break to break the context up here. It's important that we keep the context together. That way, it, it gives us a better understanding of these texts individually if we keep them all together. <clears throat> so while Jesus is in the synagogue, there's a man who comes in and he has a withered hand. And this is probably some type of paralysis or some type of deformity where this man's hand doesn't work correctly. You've probably seen someone like this before. And notice where the attention of the Pharisees is directed in verse 2. This is important to understand why Jesus is so angry at them. In, uh, in verse 2 it says, And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. Their attention is not on the man with the withered hand. Instead, their attention is locked on Jesus because they're actually looking for a reason to accuse him of doing something wrong. And I think there's some good application here about where our attention ought should, uh, ought, ought should be. How about that? Ought to be. Both for Christians and non-Christians, people inside the church and outside the church, Christians sometimes are so bent on um, catching and calling out doctrine breakers and their attention is not on people who actually have needs, who need help, whether that's help physically or whether it's help spiritually. Maybe somebody who isn't a Christian, they can fall into this as well. When we're constantly focused on the negative, what people are doing wrong instead of what people are doing right or what we could be doing that's right. A lot of the problems in the world aren't problems because people don't have the time to solve them. It's because their attention is devoted to something else. Maybe that's their attention is devoted to something because they're disinterested in that problem. Or maybe it's, it's too focused on what everyone around them is doing wrong rather than on what they could be doing to help the situation. So here the Pharisees have that same problem. And I think that's we, we, it's very easy to fall into that ourselves and to get into that kind of a mindset. We're always pessimists and we're always looking at, at other people's, always trying to catch people so that maybe that makes us feel better about ourselves. You know what would probably make us feel better about ourselves is if we help somebody in need. Uh, that typically works <laughs> when I do it. Uh, it makes me feel a whole lot better about myself than when I'm critical of somebody else. Jesus, though, is just unconcerned with their critical stares, and he calls the man to him. 
And then he speaks this bold and blatant challenge to the Pharisees. So he says to the man with the withered hand, come here. And then he looks to the Pharisees and he challenges them. And he says, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? It basically, is it okay for me to do good on the Sabbath? And Jesus has just answered this question when he gave the discussion about his disciples picking grain on the Sabbath. He conclu the conclusion was, it is right to, to, to do good on the Sabbath. Doing good on the Sabbath is not a violation of Sabbath law. Uh, and so you see the stubbornness and the thick skulls of the Pharisees. They've just been corrected by Jesus a few moments ago in the grain field. Now they're in the synagogue and they're falling into the same error that Jesus was correcting them for before. Uh, is it right for me to do good on the Sabbath? Answer, yes, it is. Uh, and Jesus has decreed that he is the Lord of the Sabbath and has the authority to say what is good and bad. And you remember that he uh, had mentioned that God desires mercy rather than sacrifice. And I think this is an occasion where that statement um, plays out in real life. So they're waiting and watching to accuse Jesus, but uh, before Jesus performs the miracle that they're anticipating, he turns to them and basically shuts down. <laughs> he destroys the foundation of the accusation that they're anticipating making. Uh, and this is not the first time that Jesus would read minds to uh, destroy counter arguments or accusations to his actions. The text says that Jesus was angry. And I think it's important to note that because a lot of times when we think of Jesus being angry, we think about Jesus overturning tables in the temple. If you don't know that story yet, we'll get there. But because it's this outward display of Jesus's anger. But here it says that he's anger at them, angry at them because of the hardness of their hearts. Why was that? Well, they were taking God's law. They were twisting it and they were using it as an excuse not to treat people well. And they looked down on someone namely Jesus in this case, who used God's law to treat other people well. God cares about people. He does not today. He did then. How do we know that God cared about people? Well, because they had a law in the first place, right? Why would God give, bother giving a law to human beings if he didn't care about them, if he, didn't, he wasn't seeking their good? Well, he wouldn't. He'd just be like, well, go off and do your own thing and get yourself killed or, you know, all the consequences of sin are out there. Go, you know, ruin your lives on those. No, but God gave us instruction for how to live properly uh, on the earth. So the law is an indication that God cares. They're twisting that law to mistreat people. And that's a problem. And Jesus is angry about it. Jesus asked the man to stretch out his hand, and, he, and so he stretches it out, and it was restored. Jesus healed it uh, to be a healthy hand once again. I want, I want you to think about the setup for this miracle and kind of the backstory behind this. It's not in the biblical text, but it's, it's implied or at least spoken about by all the other, uh, the creation account and many other scriptures. But think about the setup to this. So, Let's look at two truths. Truth number one is that Jesus created this man. Okay? Bible tells us that God created everything. So Jesus created this man. That's truth number one. Pretty obvious. Jesus knew when he made this man that he would have a withered hand. Right? Yeah. He knew that he would have a withered hand. Jesus also knew the day would come when he would meet this man in this very synagogue and heal, and he would heal this man's hand. And this miracle was designed to bring glory to God, and it was evidence of Jesus' identity to those who witnessed it. Pretty straightforward, right? Okay, so truth number two then is this. God created you, and God created me. Jesus knew when he made you what difficulties you would struggle with, what handicaps you might have, what challenges you would have in your life that maybe are unique to you and nobody else has. God knew that when he created you. <clears throat> what if he intends you to exist with all of your weaknesses for a similar reason to the man with the withered hand so that God can, can overcome 
those weaknesses. So God can be seen in overcoming those weaknesses. So that people would look at your life and praise God in his work through your weaknesses. I think this is backed up when we read, I believe it's 2 Corinthians, where Paul is talking about he's, he's not ashamed of his weaknesses. Why? Because those weaknesses make it known to the world that God is working through him. That where he's deficient, that's room for God to step in and to be seen in those areas in making Paul's work successful. So that he can sit back and say, it wasn't me who did it. It was God's sufficiency through my weakness. And so uh, your life, perhaps God created us the way that we are or, or, or created us even in light of who we would be and the challenges that we would have, the struggles that we would have, so that our lives would evidence his presence <clears throat> to those who witness it. That our lives would evidence the presence of God, making us sufficient where we're weak, um, to the people who look at our lives and, and witness them. Same principle as the man with the withered hand. I think that's a fair parallel, and I think it's true that God does work through us that way. Um, more reason not to just, just lean on our own sufficiency when we realize that, that God's power will work in our weaknesses. We are much more capable. In, even being weak, we are much more capable with the power of God behind those weaknesses that we would be relying only on our own sufficiency. So then, in our scene, the Pharisees, you know, they bow down and they, they're like, oh, we repent of everything we've ever done. Uh, forgive us. And they worship Jesus. Well, not exactly. <laughs> uh, the Pharisees, when... They had just witnessed the power of God. A man with a withered hand. Maybe they had seen this man before. Um, and his, his hand is healthy now. I mean, an unexplainable set of events outside of miraculous power. And how do they respond? They go about making plans to destroy Jesus. And you might ask, how on earth could somebody possibly respond that way? They had observed God's power. But all that they were concerned about was their own power and their own influence and what Jesus was going to do to their own power. Jesus was stealing their influence and authority, and they didn't like it. Rather than accept Jesus, they plotted to get rid of him. And I know it's really easy to look down on the Pharisees for doing this and to be really harsh in our judgment towards them, but I think a lot of us probably struggle with the same thing. Maybe you're outside of Christ or, or not a member of the church and maybe this is this is you we're maybe you're struggling with this same thing and you might say what do you mean I haven't seen anyone do a, a miracle uh, today no withered hands have been healed in my presence uh, but this is a dilemma that all of us struggle with when coming to Christ the willingness to accept our unimportance in the light of God's importance to accept our weakness in the light of God's strength to be willing to give up our authority and to realize that there's somebody far greater than us running this show that my life should, should be submitted to. That's a really hard thing for human beings to swallow because we like our autonomy to be the person who's in charge of our own lives and to be able to dictate the details of our own lives. And Christianity demands that we give up that autonomy or perceived autonomy in order to submit to a God who uh, is really the one in charge and really the only one who can give us a life worth living. If the Pharisees had verifiable evidence right in front of their faces and they still chose to run in the opposite direction. And maybe you're doing the same thing. What are your reasons for not accepting Christ as the Savior, as God, as someone who's, who should be uh, followed? What are your reasons? Maybe, maybe you think you have good reasons. Let me tell you that there are good reasons to believe in Christianity. There's verifiable evidence that the fact that Jesus is who he says he is, and that his identity can be confirmed. Uh, or, or maybe it's not that. Maybe it's not that you have a, a well-thought-out, 
logical argument for why you don't believe in God. Maybe your reasons really at the roots are you don't want to surrender to God. <laughs> you don't you don't want to have to turn your life over to somebody else and have him instruct you on how to live because you treasure being able to determine that on your own. That was the Pharisees' problem in part. And I think one thing to recognize at the end of the day when we're stuck in that dilemma is that human sovereignty, human uh, autonomy is really an illusion. We either submit to God willingly or we submit to God uh, without knowing it. And the Bible shows us that over and over and over again. So many examples in the scriptures. People like Pharaoh back in ancient Egypt, Nebuchadnezzar, Cyrus, uh, Judas, the betrayer in Jesus' story, the Pharisees themselves, uh, Pontius Pilate. Here's, here's individuals who were not consciously uh, followers of God. Some of them were hostile to what God was trying to do. Uh, but God knew about their hostility. He knew that we would reject him. And he used their actions like the Pharisees in killing Jesus ultimately to work about his plan of redemption. They thought they were escaping the sovereignty of God. They weren't going anywhere. <laughs> God, God had them perfectly where he, well, not where he wanted them, but uh, he used them perfectly, even through their rebellion to him to accomplish his will. You're not going to be able to fight the sovereignty of God. He's going to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. And so you either submit willingly, or he'll just use you anyway. And, uh, you know, the difference, though, is the outcome. If we willingly submit to God, uh, then, then we'll have salvation in the end, being one of his children. If we don't, then the ultimate outcome is much worse. Okay, so let's read now verses 7 through 12. Jesus withdrew with his, his, his disciples <laughs> to... Tried to combine apostles and disciples there. Depostles. Depostles. <laughs> Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea, and Jerusalem and Idumea, and from beyond the Jordan, and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowds heard all that he was doing, they came to him. And he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he was healing many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. Jesus' popularity is growing, and people are coming from all over Palestine and, and, well, really all over the place, to hear him preach and to be healed by him. I have a map there in your notes that shows some of the areas that are mentioned. You see Idumea down, Idumea down in the south below Judea. That's that's almost a hundred miles from Galilee, so that's no. I mean, that's going to take at least a couple days walking. Um, that's like from. That's a long ways. A hundred miles is a long ways, and people are coming this far to see Jesus. And so, no doubt, you know, it's not just things don't only spread on social media. They spread pretty quickly by word of mouth in these days. And that might give you an idea of just how massive these crowds must have been. If people were coming from a hundred miles away, uh, there must have been a lot of people there. And he was healing them. He was casting out demons. And we saw in a previous passage, and we see it again here, that Jesus is not allowing these demons who know him to call out his identity. Jesus hadn't revealed his identity yet. He didn't intend to. And his miracles are building the case for an identity that's going to be revealed later on in his ministry. So evidently, the size and the zeal of these crowds was so great that Jesus was, it says he was being crushed. There were so many people pressing in to, uh, uh, to be healed and to touch him that uh, it was just madness, right? And so he has this, 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 boat prepared by his disciples so that he can kind of get away from some of this. And other gospel accounts tell us that he would preach from boats sometimes. And you can imagine how hard it would be to preach when people are always like pushing their way. You know, people are coming all out of the countryside and, and, and pushing through these big crowds to try to get to Jesus, to try to be healed. Uh, it's pretty hard to, to 
teach or to preach when somebody's you know got their touching you all over the place that's a little distracting <laughs> and so uh, he, he he gets in this boat and uh to avoid being crushed that's what the text says let's read verses 13 through 21 now and he went up on a mountain and, and called to him those whom he desired and they came to him and he appointed 12 whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach, and have authority to cast out demons. And he appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the names Boanerges, or, or Boaner, Bo, we'll go with Bo, Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder. Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon, the zealot and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. And then he went home and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him for they were saying he is out of his mind. <clears throat> so Jesus goes up onto a mountain and from these multitudes of people who've been following him, he chooses 12 men to be his apostles. And the term apostle just means sent out. And that makes sense because of verse, where is it? Verse 14, which says that he would send them out to preach and to cast out demons and to work miracles. And these 12 men would play a pivotal role in the establishment of the church. We'll read about that in the book of Acts. They had privileges and access to Jesus that many other people well, that all other people didn't have. He would take them to places to see signs that others didn't get to see. He would reveal insights about his work and his ministry and his intentions to them that were not made widely available to the public. And he would explain things to them, like parables that others were not privy to. And he gave them miraculous powers. We will see that not only in Jesus' time on earth, but also after Jesus goes back to heaven, and we get into the book of Acts. <clears throat> so these are the 12 apostles. Simon, who Jesus named Peter, which means a stone. James, the son of Zebedee. John, his brother, also the son of Zebedee. And Jesus gave them the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. And it's, it's somewhat difficult. Well, no one really knows exactly the reason that he gave them this name. There's some speculation. I've never heard anything that really convinced me uh, as to you know, where I thought, oh yeah, that must be the reason. But Jesus must have had a reason for naming them this, and so he does, sons of thunder. There was Andrew, who was Simon's brother. Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, Alphaeus. Oh, wait. No, not Alphaeus. James was the son of Alphaeus. Delete. Notes edited. Okay. <laughs> Thomas, James, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot. Uh, what's a zealot, you might ask? A couple, a couple thoughts on that. There was a group of Jews who were resistant to the Roman rule of Judea. And sometimes they were even militaristically hostile to it. And some people think that Simon may have been one of these individuals. There's some debate about that when the zealots actually first appeared on the scene, etc. So it may be that he belonged to a group like that, or it may be that um, he, he got this name Zealot because he was zealous. He was devoted, passionate about some other cause, just not told. And Judas Iscariot, who is the one who betrayed Jesus. So following the, the call of the Twelve, Mark records an event uh, that's, that's not given in Matthew's Gospel. Jesus goes home, probably this is a reference to Capernaum where he stayed, and the crowds begin to form again. And uh, there's so many people that it, it makes it impossible to eat. They're trying, apparently trying to eat something and they can't because there's so many people. And I want you to just take a moment here and admire the patience of Jesus. He couldn't even leave his house, or for that matter, be in a house <laughs> without being pressed upon by a mob. And I'm sure that not all of these people were probably as polite as they should have been, probably as well-behaved as they should have been, uh, and, and respectful 
to others and maybe even to Jesus as they should have been. You know, every once in a while you'll hear in the news, like the tabloids or something like that, that a, a celebrity gets really angry at the paparazzi and throws something at them or yells at them or cusses them out or, you know, they lose their cool because they're tired of being followed around, followed by these people. And uh, that happens quite often. And that would be really easy to do. It'd be super frustrating to have somebody following you and touching you and wanting to talk to you all hours of the day. And, and yet, that's the situation that Jesus is in. <clears throat> Excuse me. And his patience uh, really shines here through this multi-year ministry. Jesus never sinned in interacting with any of these people. And if that was the only thing that Jesus accomplished in three years of ministry, like that would be admirable. Uh, obviously, we know he did more, but but don't don't underestimate some of the things that Jesus had to go through in order to, oh, man, I'm a mess. Some of the things that he had to endure, uh, we talk about the temptations, you know, in, in Mark chapter 1, Matthew chapter 4. <laughs> this in and of itself would have been a temptation. And then here's another part of this that we don't read about in Matthew. And, and that's that Jesus' family heard about this uproar and how this the, all these people had surrounded Jesus. And they attempted to seize him, it says, because they thought that he was out of his mind. So Jesus had family members. We don't know exactly how many were still alive or here at this particular scene, but we know he had his mother, and then he also had brothers and sisters. We'll, we'll talk about them towards the end of the chapter. But they come along, and um, they try to seize Jesus because they think he's crazy. And that's not hard for me to relate to. Probably anyone who has siblings can probably relate to this. You know, if one of my brothers started preaching and he gained thousands of followers and he claimed that he could do miracles <laughs> and that, you know, he was the Messiah sent down from heaven, I would be like, you're nuts. You're crazy. Like, I grew up with you. I know you. <laughs> you're <laughs> like, I may not be able to explain everything that you're doing right now, but you're not come down from heaven. I grew up in the same house as you, in the same old dinky town. Right? That would be really hard to believe. And I would have to see some really convincing evidence before I was willing to accept that claim on any level. Right? It would take a lot of convincing. And in the same way, it took a lot of convincing for Jesus' brothers and sisters. And you wonder, you know, how much Mary had told them about Jesus and the angel Gabriel and, and, and Joseph and all those events that had taken place, the shepherds and the star and the, the wise men and all that. We wonder how much they knew about that uh, and if they knew that Jesus was born in the way that he was born. Uh, maybe they didn't. And so when Jesus turns 30, you know, he comes out claiming that he's, he's doing miracles and teaching about the law. And they're like, what is this? So <laughs> we know eventually, though, that they did come to accept Christ as their savior. But it took a while. All right, so this brings us now to the uh, probably the most difficult part of this this text, and also the one that most people are interested in, and that's this uh, this whole blasphemy of the Holy Spirit business. Now, if you're with us in Matthew chapter 12, we've kind of already discussed this, and you probably already have a good idea of what's going on here. But let's let's break this down in the context of Mark, and we'll pull in a few statements that Matthew makes as well to help us to understand what Jesus is saying. Let's read verse 22. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out demons. Matthew's gospel tells us that this statement, this accusation of the scribes, came right after Jesus had healed a man who was oppressed by a demon. <clears throat> Jesus cast the demon out, and then he heals the man. And, and Matthew tells us that those who surrounded this scene, the audience saw Jesus do this, and they began to think to themselves. They considered the evidence that was in front of them, and they began to think, you know what, maybe this is the son of David. Maybe this is the Messiah, the man who we've been waiting for all these years to be the deliverer of our people. The truth, you know, they looked at the evidence, they were, they were uh, fair with that evidence, and the truth was starting to form in their minds. They may not have been highly educated people, um, but common sense was piecing these facts together. 
But the, quote, educated elite of the Jews, these Pharisees and these scribes, they said, oh, no, 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 that's not, that's not true. He's not the son of David. The common Jews were on to something here. And the Pharisees quickly attempted to shoot it down, stating that Jesus' power was from the devil. Uh, Beelzebul is another, just another name for, for Satan. And so they said, no, 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 this isn't the son of David. Uh, he's, he's not, he doesn't have the power of God. This is, he has the power of the devil. And I kind of wonder how much the Pharisees really thought about that response. Because it seems kind of terrible. Uh, here Jesus is casting out demons with the power of the demons. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Jesus is about to point out how obviously wrong that answer is. We're going to read verses 23 through 26. Jesus is about to tell them how stupid that was for them to say. I wonder if that was just like the first thing that kind of came into their mind. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, the kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. So make no mistake, what the Pharisees had just proposed was complete nonsense. Jesus here says that. They were suggesting that Jesus was defeating Satan's servants with Satan's power. Face palm, right? Insert face palm. Dumb. That's just dumb. You don't have to be a theologian <laughs> to figure that out. That's dumb. Uh, and uh, Jesus immediately rebukes them for this ignorant comment. He says, if a kingdom goes to war against itself... That kingdom's not going to be very strong. Kingdoms don't want to fight themselves. They want to fight enemies to conquer new lands. If a house is divided, maybe a husband and a wife are divided, or it's divided in some other way, that house isn't going to be very strong. A businessman doesn't try to sabotage his own business. That would be stupid. Satan is not ignorant enough to go to war with himself and cast out his own servants with his own power. So now that we've established the stupidity of that, let's read verse 27. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed, he may plunder his house. This verse I find to be a little bit confusing, a little bit tricky. But when you, when you figure it out and keep it in context, uh, it, it clicks. So Jesus has just said, Satan's house is not fighting itself. And if Satan's house isn't destroying itself from the inside... It must be a force from the outside that's attacking Satan. He gives an illustration, a parable. If you're going to rob a strong man, what do you have to do in order to be able to rob that man? He says, you have to manage to tie that guy up. Otherwise, he's going to beat you up. <laughs> you, have to get a, you have to manage to tie him up. And then once he's tied up and his power is taken away, you can take what belongs to him. You can rob his house, basically. And so uh, what does this have to do with what Jesus is talking about here? Well, as Jesus has just uh, talked about and, and explained, Satan isn't attacking himself. Jesus here is explaining his power over Satan. Uh, his power is, is coming from the outside of Satan's house, and it's victoring over Satan. Uh, Satan is the, is the strong man in the story, and Jesus has the power to bind him and take what belongs to him. Not by Satan's power, but by an outside force. In this case, uh, the demon-possessed man belongs to Satan in the fact that his demon is oppressing him, kind of has possession of him. And Jesus is coming in uh, with the Spirit of God to plunder what belongs to Satan. So he's, he's casting out the demon. He's taking that man back to his side by the power of God, the Spirit of God. So that's the example here directly in this text. But kind of in a wider sense, Jesus has come with the power of the Spirit of God to plunder all that Satan possesses and has kept by the power of sin. So Satan has an accusation over all mankind that we are all sinners, we're all separated from God. And that sin, because of that sin, we deserve to be condemned. Jesus has come with the power of God to take what belongs to Satan and what he possesses. And that is us, 
right? To forgive us of those things, to reconcile us to God, to remove that separation between us and God, and to bring us into his, God's house. So that's the picture. Satan's the strong man. Jesus has the power to bind him and to overthrow him. If Jesus wasn't casting out demons with Satan's power, it must have been through the power of God, or the spirit of God. And if God's spirit is at work in the world, it signifies that the kingdom is coming and that God's reign is coming and that Satan no longer has dominion. Verse 28 through 30. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whoever blasphemes, or whoo, messed that up. Let's try that again. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man in whatever blasphemies they utter. But whosoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. Let's bring in a verse from Matthew here to help us to get the full context of this dialogue. So between Mark chapter 3 verses 27 and 28 in Matthew's account, there's uh, a verse here that we'll pull in. And that Jesus says, whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. So Jesus leaves no middle ground here. You're either in the strong man's house, in Satan's house, in his possession, doing his will, or by the spirit of God, you've been delivered from that and you're serving Christ. He says, it's one way or another. There's no in between. This is, this is a black and white issue. You either belong to the power of Satan or you belong to the spirit of God. You either gather with Christ or you scatter with Satan. Uh, you're either in one camp or the other. And this dichotomy, these opposites, make it clear the seriousness of rejecting the power of God. He says every sin, every blasphemy can be forgiven except blasphemy of the Spirit, except blasphemy of God's power, right, to deliver you. Um, which would, you know, is the work of the Spirit. What is blasphemy? That's probably a question that we need to ask. Here's a quick definition. The act of insulting or showing contempt or a lack of reverence for God. So is there a greater blasphemy than what the Pharisees have just done? Think about what they just did. They just looked at God's power and they said, that's not the power of God. That's the power of the devil. Is there, any, is there any statement that you could make that would show more contempt or more of a lack of reverence for the spirit of God than that statement right there? Contri- saying, Looking at God's work and saying, that's the devil's work. That's disrespectful, right? That's, a, that's blasphemy. So the Pharisees, with their own tongues, had confessed which camp they belonged in, to whom their loyalties lie. And it wasn't to Christ. They chose the side that they accused Jesus of drawing his power from. So you see the hypocrisy here. They're actually on Satan's side, yet they're accusing Jesus of being on Satan's side and using his power. But it proves that they're actually the ones who are under the power of Satan. As long as they persisted in mocking and rejecting God's power, God's spirit, they would not find forgiveness in this life or in the next life. Why? Because Satan has them in his possession as he did or as he does all men at first at when they've sinned. So Satan has these individuals in his possession and the power they blasphemed, the power they disrespected is the only power that can deliver them from the possession of Satan. Right? Let me try to say that again. Why can't they be forgiven of that blasphemy? Because Satan had them in his possession, and the power that they blasphemed was the only power to bind Satan and to free them. If you weren't free of Satan and the condemnation that Satan's going to receive, what's the only power that's strong enough to deliver you from that? God's power. Right? That's why Jesus had to come. So they're mocking God's power. And so they're not going to be able to be forgiven. When we look at uh, Jesus's work, you know, Jesus's work is not complete yet. 
when we're re when the story is taking place. He still needs to die on the cross, be resurrected, ascend back into heaven. When all of that work was accomplished, he would send the Spirit of God into the world, and the Spirit would guide men into the truth. It would show them how to have access to the blood of Jesus as the atoning sacrifice, the, the atoning price to uh, have their sins forgiven and to have Satan finally off their back and to change camps from the devil's house to God's house. And we know that many Jews who had mocked Jesus and even the ones who had had cried out to have him crucified, when they heard the Spirit preaching through Peter on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, they repented and they were forgiven of their sins and baptized into Christ. They had mocked the Spirit of God. They had mocked the power of God. They had hung Jesus up on a cross. And, uh, but when they had, had realized what they had done, and they cried out, what shall we do? And Peter says, God's the only one who can save you. And they said, okay, we need to get on board with that. Right? They no longer blasphemed that power. Instead, they cherished it and they valued it. And so they could have repentance. And they did have repentance. But those who rejected Christ during his life and rejected the messengers of Christ and his spirit even after his death, and even on Acts, in, during Acts chapter 2 and in the whole book of Acts, and, and continue that way until they died. They would not be forgiven until they left off scattering with the devil and came to gather with Christ. You cannot be forgiven so long as you persist in holding the Spirit of God in contempt. As long as a person is in a state of treating the Spirit of God with contempt or failing to reverence it, they can't be forgiven because God's power is the only power capable of freeing them from their sins. We've said that a couple times now trying to just drive that home. Um, and so when we look at, when we look at uh, the context here, I think we can come to a reasonable conclusion about what Jesus is talking about. Context is really important, I think, in interpreting these passages. A lot of people interpret these passages in all different kinds of ways. Interpreting the blasphemy of the Spirit is all different kinds of sins. And, uh, but, but what is it in context? And Mark gives us a little bit of a clue there in verse 30 when he says, he said this because they had said that he had an unclean spirit. Um, so that's important to keep in mind and the miracle that Jesus had just worked. So blaspheming the spirit is holding God's spirit in contempt, not in contempt, <laughs> is, is showing contempt, irreverence, disrespect for what God has done and his power to deliver you. And so long as you disrespect that, um, there is no forgiveness. There is no one to bind the strong man and save you from the devil's house. Okay. Verses 31 through 35, and we'll conclude here. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Someone came to Jesus and they notified him. They said, hey, your, your family's outside. Uh, probably thinking that he would want to go see them. This would have been Mary and then Jesus' brothers and sisters, half-brothers and sisters. Their names are given in Mark chapter 6, verse 3. And as Jesus did so often, he took this opportunity, this everyday experience to teach a spiritual lesson. This wasn't, I don't think, a disrespect in any way to his mother or his, or his brothers. <clears throat> but he asked the question, who are my, who, who really are, who's really my family? Who's really my brothers and my sisters and my mother? A tr the true family of God are those who identify with Jesus and accept his heaven-given message. We as Christians are invited to be uh, brothers, to be in the family of God, to be children of God. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. 1 John chapter 3, verse 10, John writes, By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God nor is the one who does not love his brother. So the, the children of God are those who are obedient to God. 
The blood of Christ is stronger than any of our familial bonds. And that's a good thing. A lot of times we read that and we're like, oh no, nothing could be stronger than my family. But aren't you glad that the bonds of Christ are stronger than than blood relative ties here on earth with our immediate or our extended families? Because what happens to that when we die? Those, those ties get severed, right? Our loved ones die. They're not around anymore. Our, our connection to them is broken. We have no access to them. So, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's gone at that point, our relationship with them. But isn't it awesome that when we're family in Christ, not only with our immediate family, but also all the people out in the world, um, that the bond of Christ's blood is only reaffirmed in death. That we got to be together here on the earth, but we're confident that we're also going to be together after death, that we're going to overcome that death, and we're going to be together in the presence of God in a better place and a better relationship than we've ever been before. You know, that should be tremendously comforting to us. And for those of us who value our families, um, that's even more reason to get your family on board with the message of Jesus. And if there's somebody who's who's urging you to come to Christ, and maybe they're a Christian, uh, this is part of the reason. It's because they don't want that 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 bond of love to be severed upon your death or their death. They want it to be able to continue on into eternity. So that's Mark chapter three. Um, we have all those resources online, so I'd encourage you to go get those. And uh, I think that's all we got today. A little bit did one chapter about. 45, 50 minutes, not too bad. Hoping to make that more of a consistent pattern. So I will uh, see you guys for Mark chapter 4 in two days. See ya.